It's U of L today on 93.9 The Phil. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. Well, you all know that uh, it's been some tough times and some tough days for the University of Louisville, but this is the show that's about all the good things happening at the University of Louisville. This is U of L today with Mark Hebert on 93.9 The Ville. Thanks for joining us today. What do we got coming up on the program? Well, a little bit later on the second half of the show, U of L is one of the first schools in the country to have a program for training medical students on the special health care needs of LGBTQ individuals. And we'll talk with the director of that program and talk about other LGBT initiatives on U of L's campus as well. But first, the University of Louisville has an aggressive program to seek and find adequate health care for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Dr. Priya Shandan and Dr. Matt Holder are working together on this problem. Doctor, is it Chandon or Chandon? Chandon. Chandon. Dr. Chandon is with the U of L School of Medicine. Dr. Holders with the Lee Specialty Clinic in Louisville. So, welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Great to see you. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, what this. Uh, well, first of all, I guess we ought to ask uh, Dr. Holder, what is the Lee Specialty Clinic? Well, the the Lee Specialty Clinic is a uh, specialized clinic that cares for adults and adolescents with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we provide a number of different um, specialties of practice, so medicine, dentistry, psychiatry, uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, neurology, gotcha. ophthalmology, all the, all it just the, keeps all, the needs all the ologies, yeah. Social <laughs> disabilities, yeah. I got you. Yeah. All right, Dr. Chandon, you work uh, in the School of Medicine. Yes, I'm in the School of Medicine in the Department of Neurosurgery Division of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and then I'm also in the School of Public Health. Okay, so how did you get involved with uh, people with disabilities and taking such an interest in that? Um, well, I guess it all started, my older brother has Down syndrome, so oh, that's okay. sort of how I became interested in this population. Yeah, that would get you um, interested, yeah. Yeah, so personally, that's how I was interested, and then when I went to medical school, I wanted to be a physician who serves this population, so. Okay, and so that's what that's what got you started, mm -hmm. and so you go to medical school, you get involved in this population, so what's going on now? What, what are you two working on in terms of... Uh, uh, the healthcare needs of folks with uh, intellectual disabilities? Um, well, so there's a large project that we're working on that relates to medical education um, because what we see is one of the barriers to this population getting quality care is the fact that providers aren't trained to take care of them. Uh, most of the time, if providers get exposure to this population, it's sort of um, in their pediatrics rotation, maybe only it's children. And so now we see that these individuals are becoming adults, they're living longer, and so we need a workforce that is capable of taking care of these individuals as adults. So it's a large sort of medical education project. It's a nationwide project. Um, in the first cohort, there's three schools that are involved. So U of L is one, as well as Baylor College of Medicine and University of Colorado. Um, so there's nationwide efforts as well as efforts here locally at U of L. Okay, and that's that you got a grant or, or something to go along with that, correct? Mm -hmm. And what was that? So the grant is I can speak to sort of what the grant here at U of L looks like, and you can speak to sort okay. of what the grant program nationwide okay. looks like. Mm -hmm. um, but so here at U of L, it's a grant to enhance the curriculum to train the medical students. And so what we've done at U of L is we've created a rotation for the fourth year medical students at Lee Specialty Clinic. So they get to go out there now. Um, and then we also are doing a program with the second year medical students in conjunction with Special Olympics Kentucky. So Special Olympics Kentucky has an athlete leadership program. So these are self-advocates um, who are just awesome to work with, <laughs> frankly. And we are working with them on a project where they're discussing what health means to them and what advice they have for doctors. And then they, they are going to present that project to the medical students. Once again, we're talking with Dr. Priya Chandon from the University of Louisville and Dr. Matt Holder from the Lee Specialty Clinic here in Louisville. Well, Matt, why don't you tell us about then what you specifically, what your role is in this nationwide program? Sure. Um, so my other, uh, one of the other hats that I wear is as the uh, chairman of the Medical Advisory Committee for Special Olympics International. Um, and they are global medical advisor. And so we have a very large public health program at Special Olympics. Um, we actually have over 5 million athletes around the world through Special Olympics. And we have a very large public health screening program. And part of that um, program has now expanded to try to impact the way doctors are trained in the United States. And so uh, this grant really came from the CDC through Special Olympics, now, uh, now all the way through to U of L, so that um, we can be sort of on the front lines of changing medical education around the country 
for this uh, for taking care of this population. Gotcha. Who are some of the individuals that we're talking about here with these intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities? Are we talking about folks with mental retardation? Are we talking about autism? What are we talking about? Yeah. So so f first and foremost, uh, they're people just like you and me. You know, they they have jobs. They um, have activities. They have families. They do lots of things out in the community. Um, but from a medical standpoint, we're talking about people that have intellectual disabilities. So that's actually the new term, mental retardation, is sort of right. the old term. We we don't use that too much anymore. I'm but not being PC there. Anyway. Right, right, yeah. We'll, we'll get <laughs> so the PC used police to be, after. It used to be yeah. the Council for Mental Retardation. Yeah. In the exactly. State of Kentucky, so that's time, right. That's times right. They are changing, I guess. That's huh? right. But um, so it's intellectual disability, um, autism. Um, there's actually a thousand different causes out there. So this is a really wide audience. But the ones you'll you'll have heard of: cerebral palsy, for example; Down syndrome, for example. Right. Um, and then there are many, many others that we work with. So what's the difference in treating a patient with developmental disabilities than any of the three of us? And what, what do students need to know as they're graduating from the UofL Medical School or nursing or, or public health? What do they need to know? So I, I think one of the first things is that sometimes communication can be a little bit difficult. Um, the, it, it, our, our patients that we see sometimes have very significant um, physical and, and uh, intellectual disabilities, but also communication difficulties. And that means that finding information, finding medical information out about them can be difficult. And sometimes um, it might present in a different way. So, for example, um, if somebody is having pain, uh, you or I might say, hey, you know, my mouth hurts. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, easy enough. We can figure that one out. But somebody who has a significant uh, communication difficulty may not even be able to tell us that. And so that they might try to show us that. And that can be misinterpreted by the medical community as a psychiatric issue or some other kind of issue. And so they, if, if you All don't right. have the training, you start going down the, the wrong path, perhaps prescribing drugs that they shouldn't be on and that kind of thing. So our job really is to try to find out what's going on with the patient. Once we figure that out, a lot of the treatments are really the same. All right. And Priya, what are the... Um what are the, some of the classes, I guess, or the courses or seminars? What are you offering to students at UofL to get them to this point where they, where they can make better diagnosis and deal with some of these patients? So right now we have a elective um, for the fourth year medical students so they can sign up to take that and then it's for a month long and they go out to Lee Specialty Clinic. Um, we just started that so we're in, having students come out there now. And then we're also doing a class for the second years. So the second year medical students are broken down into sort of small groups. And we're working very closely with the undergraduate medical education office. Um, Dr. Amy Holthauser is um, the co-PI on I this project Amy. with me. Yeah, and she's been very supportive. So with their sort of buy-in for this project, we've been able to create a discussion with a group of medical students, about 10, 12 medical students, and a Special Olympics Kentucky athlete from the Athlete Leadership Program. And they just have a discussion about, um, about health, about health care, um, and it's really cool because it's totally led by the athlete. And so some of the things, I guess, that I've been hearing the athletes tell me as far as what is important um, for doctors to know, communication is a big part of it. Um, and so getting information can be difficult, but overwhelmingly they say one of the things they would like medical students to know is to talk to me directly. Yes. Gotcha. Um, and so they're like, you know, don't, don't look at my caregiver. They may be able to supplement information, but ask me first because there are things that I can tell you. Gotcha. So gotcha. that's kind of the focus of that class. It's a lot on communication um, and just becoming comfortable with, with this population. You've got something coming up that should be helpful, hopefully, to medical providers and I assume also families of those with intellectual disabilities. Tell us about it. So we are having a conference on November 4th. It's the third time, I believe, that we're doing yes. this conference. Um, and it's about um, taking care of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so it's for a wide audience. So like you mentioned, there's a bunch of different topics for medical providers as well as for families and caregivers, as well as for public health professionals. So it really is sort of a wide variety um, of sessions that are going to be offered. And we're excited because this time we've partnered um, with some new partners for us. So in the past it was um, just in U of L, but we're excited that we've got partners now from UK, as well as um, we're having speakers from Baylor and from New York. New York. Mm -hmm. oh, wow! So. And so folks can sign up for this somehow. Is it on online or in person? What What is this? Yes, yes, um, <laughs> yes, and yes. Yes, right? and yes. yes. It's it's online. Um, and of course, I'd have to get the. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. Remember the, what, what can I search to find it? 
What um, can I search to find? So just just look for um, the University of Louisville um, Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Conference, third annual mm-hmm. conference, and that should get you there. Okay, and that's November November, 4th. November the 4th. Uh-huh. Okay, it's right. an all-day conference. And it's here in Louisville? Yes. Where is it being held? Uh, down at the medical school. Okay, so it's mm-hmm. at the medical school, mm-hmm. but if you want to watch online, you can. It's, yes. You're mm-hmm. going to stream it. Okay. That's right. And you just got to find it at the address that Matt doesn't know. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> we Didn't do help. my homework. We, yeah, we can help you there. That's okay. A couple other questions, um, Bria. When, when you were dealing with your brother, did yeah. you ever see any instances where um, there was a doctor or someone that was just totally insensitive or just couldn't deal with, with the uh, disability from your brother? <laughs> yeah, brother I mean, that definitely happens. I would say what's happened more commonly than sort of just being insensitive is just being hesitant. And so he'll have normal health conditions that everyone else has. He got a cold, he had pneumonia. And we would go to just normal primary care offices and they would say, well, I don't know how to treat that, you know, because he has Down, he has Down syndrome. And so that was something that, you know, I think the providers just felt a little uncomfortable because they hadn't interacted with the population. They know how to treat pneumonia, but they just felt a little uncomfortable because of that. So that's why we're hoping getting the medical students over at Lee will help. (laughs) All right, and and getting them over the Lee to do some training on that, right? Yeah. And they're dealing, you said specifically, with a Special Olympics athlete, correct, who's telling them here's here's what you should do and here's what you shouldn't do? Yeah, so there's there's two parts of the project. So the fourth year students are over at Lee, right. and then the second years right. are yeah. working with yeah, the right. athlete leaders. Okay, mm-hmm. all right, well, very good. Well, you might be interested in what's coming up next after you guys, because we're gonna be talking to folks who are training future doctors, nurses, and dentists about the unique healthcare needs of LGBT adults. Yes. That's, That's a great program. Kind of the, it is a great program. Category. All right, well, Dr. Priya Chandon and Matt Holder, thanks for being on the program. The University of Louisville is one of the first schools in the country to offer training to students in the medical fields on caring for LGBT individuals. Stacey Steinbach is Vice Provost for Diversity and Equal Opportunity on the HSC campus, while Brian Buford is Assistant Provost for Diversity and Equal Opportunity on the main campus, and they're here to talk about UofL's LGBT efforts. Welcome to both of you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Had you you both on before, and we've talked about these issues before, but let's talk about them again, because... Um, I saw a article or a study that I think Stacy was part of that uh, talked about U of L's efforts in training um, the students in the different medical fields on how to deal with LGBT patients. So, Stacy, why don't you talk a little bit about what the Health Sciences Campus is doing in that respect? I would love to. So, this is a project that we started back in 2013. It's called the LGBT Health Certificate. And it's been a really exciting project to work on because we realized from the very beginning that there was huge demand for this. Our our students in the medical fields and health fields down on our HSC campus showed up in droves and really voted with their feet to say, oh my gosh, I need more training to be able to work in a competent way, in a comfortable way with LGBTQ folks. So when we started it, we did six sessions that very first year, 2013-2014, and we had... um, an average of about 50 people attend each one, and it was open to all students, staff, and faculty, and really any community member who would want to come. Um, and it was really geared towards the health sciences. And um, so those schools on our health sciences campus, just to remind us, are nursing, medicine, public health, and dentistry. So we really um, brought in speakers who could speak to those various disciplines and be able to adapt it to say, here are the unique healthcare concerns of this population of people, the LGBTQ population, and this is how it would look different, be showing up differently in, um, you know, in medicine or in nursing and really help people both get like some, um, a chance to really think about what they've learned about LGBTQ people and maybe shift attitudes and also increase their knowledge base and walk away feeling more equipped to be able to work with this population. And U of L is one of the only schools that's doing something like this, aren't this we? This is true. Yeah. So what happened is that this certificate program, the way that people really showed up, and I will say in that second year, we offered 11, pro- 11 sessions over the year, and we had an average of about 80 people come to each session. 
And um, and what it really showed us is that there was great interest for this, and it really helped build momentum on that campus to create um, a, a, a curriculum within the medical school that would be part of the required curriculum because a certificate was something extracurricular that people could do who were interested. And in some ways, you could kind of say, you're preaching to the choir. These are maybe people who are already in the know. What about folks who are coming from a background where they don't feel like they've ever met anyone who's LGBTQ and wouldn't necessarily go to that? They're also going to need that training. Um, as their medical providers out in the field. So what happened from there is that we really had tremendous buy-in from our leadership and from students. You could think of it as kind of a top-down and a, a bottom-up or grassroots movement up to create curriculum within the medical school. And we are the first in the nation to take the American Association of Medical Colleges recommendations for how to work with LGBTQ patients well and implement them into our curriculum. And we're doing that in a very integrated way throughout the curriculum. Brian Buford, why is this a big deal for the University of Louisville? Well, I'll tell you why. It's, it's a big deal to me personally, and it's a big deal to all the LGBT folks that I know. And that's because I hardly know a person who identifies as LGBT who doesn't have some story of difficulty um, talking to a doctor, accessing health care. Um, you know, I, I've had doctors in the past where I had to educate them in order to get the health care that I needed. And so what we know statistically is that LGBT people, and especially trans folks, are less likely to uh, seek medical care for essential you know, needs because of the things that have happened, the difficult experiences, sometimes you know, just um, microaggressions that they experience in the doctor's office. So what we want is to uh, reduce those obstacles to care and make sure that doctors are competent. Um, I think lots of doctors want to be, but they just have never had the training. And so now UofL, I always frame it this way for myself, UofL is giving them the training that will make them the best doctors in the country. Right. Well, and we're already turning out the best doctors in the country before That's 2013. Right. Even, better. even better. I know. <laughs> One more way to certify. Yes, they're excellent. We're talking with Brian Buford and Stacey Steinbach from the University of Louisville, and uh, we're talking about the LGBTQ uh, training down at the uh, Health Sciences campus. Um, what are you finding that students, when they come into the program, what's the difficult thing that they have trouble doing when they're talking with LGBTQ um, patients. Mm -hmm. What's the most difficult thing they find that they have to overcome that this training may help? Right. So I think one of the things that students find the most difficult from kind of from any of those professional backgrounds is the communication with transgender patients. And the reason for that is really twofold. One, we're really trained to um, think of gender in like male and mm -hmm. female, and these are solid categories and they never change for anyone ever, which is absolutely not true. And so they have to get kind of through some kind of mental gymnastics to um, use the correct pronouns and to use a preferred Is it they, name. them, him, her? Yeah. Yes. And I get it. I, yes, I mean, I, I those of us too. who are straight and yeah. grew up in a different world I would clearly have that problem. So mm -hmm. for healthcare professionals, I think as you're asking, yes. um, I'm assuming a medical history would be really tough to ask those questions. It is. It is. And it's also really hard to get over that cognitive dissonance of sitting down with someone who's transgendered to do that and to create a really comfortable atmosphere for them, part of our training is that really from the moment that they step into the office, they need to be having an, uh, an experience that's affirming for them as transgender mm -hmm. people to be able to share openly and to be able to share those important details with their medical provider around their health. And so to create that kind of welcoming, affirming, safe environment from the beginning is something that um, not many, you know, the medical system just hasn't had to think about in the past or maybe hasn't been willing. Mm -hmm. And now there's some aperture there. There's really some interest and some willingness to say, wow, how do I create an entire healthcare experience for someone from the moment that they're filling out their intake forms to the interactions that they're having with the people at the front desk to getting their weight and height taken <laughs> and kind of the chit chat that happens, you know, between staff and a patient to the moment that they sit down with their um, nurse practitioner or healthcare provider and, and they're getting asked, you know, more difficult questions. Right. Right. And that's mm -hmm. an entire healthcare system thing, right. as you well right. know, right. between like the electronic health records, but also the training of front desk staff. 
So I would say that's where people struggle the most, and, and I get the most questions around transgender mm -hmm. health. And, and mm -hmm. what do you hear, Brian, from the LGBTQ community um, about this program? Has anybody mentioned it to you now that the word is out that oh, UofL is doing this training? Absolutely. I think, uh, so what's really exciting is that this has become a national model. Um, Stacy and the team there at Health Sciences just published a, a sort of how we did it article in the Journal of Health Science mm -hmm. Education. Uh -huh. And so, um, so you know, I was just at Texas Tech last week and had an opportunity to talk to folks at their school of medicine who said, how did you do it? We really, you know, we also see this need. So Stacy uh, has really led what, what is becoming a national conversation. And it's great to see U of L, you know, there in the in the forefront, um, and and people are excited. I think LGBT people are excited at the thought that their providers will be more competent. Do you you, you talked about the um, what the students were saying coming out? So I'm assuming the students are saying, "Hey, this is a great program. Mm -hmm. This has really helped me be a better doctor." So have you looked? It's only been in place since 2013. So do you have any evidence or surveys of a, the patients mm -hmm. four years later, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. B, the students who are now doctors, nurses, dentists, four years later saying, um, yes, this was really good, or here are still the holes in your curriculum? Yes, it's a great question, and that is the million dollar question, actually. So I want to give a shout out here to the research team who's helping to answer that question, and that's Susan Sawning and her staff in the Medical Education Research Unit. And they have given incredible amounts of time and expertise to put together um, an entire research package around this to make sure that we're collecting all the data and asking those questions, both pre and post for our students. And we're starting to translate that into the clinical space. I do have to give you a cliffhanger, which is that we're presenting <laughs> at the AAMC conference in just a few weeks on some of those initial outcomes. And then we have a paper planned. So I can't give you all of the nitty gritty details, um, but I think that I can give you some exciting leads, okay. <laughs> which is that one of the Tease things- Tease me a little bit. Okay, yeah. okay, so here, here's the teaser, which is that it is very, very difficult to shift attitudes. That's one of the things that we were hopeful that we could do, but we also were very cautious and that just is hard for human beings to do. And it shifted more than we had ever expected. And I think that's because we provided so many opportunities for people to meet LGBTQ mm -hmm. patients and really have face-to-face -face conversations and to hear about some of the struggles that people have had. And that, um, that I think, is going to be a really kind of beautiful part of this project is to be able to um, help other schools do it better in their schools, too, and to be working with their community, I would say, is one of the most helpful things that we did was to really get the community involved, and they yeah. wanted to be involved, too, wanted to be able to share their stories. Yeah, I love that. The, our, our, uh, several of our transgender community members actually go to the School of Medicine and have practice sessions with the students, helping them and giving them feedback about how they did and, and those challenging pronouns and things that we all are still trying to get our minds around. So um, they're a part of the process. The, the community has really owned it and uh, has gone in and given us a lot of their time to just help train these folks. Again, yeah, we're talking with Brian Buford and Stacey Steinbach, who are with the Diversity and Equal Opportunity Offices on the uh, UofL campus. And we're talking about what's going on on the health sciences campus, the well, it dental school, medical school, public Nursing. health, and who am I forgetting? Nursing. Nursing, Nursing. thank you very much. <laughs> um, and those students coming through. So how many students at the University of Louisville have gone through this program since 2013? So through our health certificate program, uh, we are nearing the thousand mark for people who have participated in some way in the LGBT health certificate. And then we have about 250 people who have um, completed the certificate and can hold it in their hands and mm -hmm. say, this is my certificate. And what I tell students when they ask me, you know, why would I do the certificate? And it's really because it is a way for you to get the skills and the uh, knowledge that you need to work competently with a population of people who are considered a vulnerable population and experiencing really shocking health disparities. It's also mm -hmm. a way to show a future employer that you care about diversity and that you're willing to get some extra training to make sure that you're trained up to be able to do that. So um, people are actually really excited mm -hmm. to hold that certificate in their hands. They and are. I like to imagine that it sits on their walls somewhere <laughs> <laughs> as they're practicing because it's a wonderful way to kind of showcase for your LGBTQ patients. but 
any patient from a vulnerable health population to say, I care, I'm going the extra mile. Yeah. We actually have a few people who have gone through it twice who just found it <laughs> yes. so useful and just to continue to refresh their, their memories have actually done this series twice. I'm interested to know if you've got any anecdotal stories from graduates of U of L Medical School, nursing school, whatever, who have gone back to a rural community, mm. Lebanon, Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, Mayfield, and practiced in their hometown and have set up practice and now they've got the certificate. Have they had any folks come to them who are LGBT in those small rural Kentucky towns and say, I heard you went through the program at U of L. It's a sales tool. That's why I'm coming to you. Mm, is that? I would love to know that, that too. I have not heard that anecdotally. Have you? I, I, I suspect, though, uh, we have one friend, a physician uh, in rural in a rural town, who says that the more he sends the message that he's inclusive, uh, the more some of his existing patients come out to him. So they've been holding on to that information, worried. Can I tell you? Well, you know, is, is this a safe space? Right. But those messages that we send, the more we say we're inclusive, the more comfort we create. And really then, as you can imagine, we have a much better conversation about your healthcare needs when, when we can be completely open. So I know he has said more of his patients are coming out in their, um, in their conversations with him. Some of them he's had for a long time, but well, now they feel safer. Well, it's interesting to see if these people from small towns, mm -hmm. as, yeah. as you yes. all graduates, are going back to their small mm -hmm. towns and using it as a sales tool. It's some, um, to yeah. say, look, yeah. I went through yeah. this LGBTQ training, yeah. and, or, or are they worried about the local minister in the little small town uh, right. saying, oh, he's, right. yeah. he's a gay-friendly yeah. person, yeah. You know, they're going to hell. Your doctor, uh, if you're in a small town, your doctor could be the only person you've told. And, and if be. you only get to tell one person, you're telling mm -hmm. your doctor is pretty important yes. yeah. to make sure that you get you good think. health. Yeah. All right, what's next, Stacy, in this program? So I think next we are really looking at um, expanding our work into the clinical sphere. So we've really been focused on medical education at this point in the first four years. So now we have the opportunity to be thinking about how do we work better with our residents and then how do we also work better with our institutions and really think about the systems that are creating um, opportunities to be more inclusive. So um, I have been doing a lot of work with ULP and folks there have been tremendous. Uh, last week we actually um, changed our non-discrimination policy for patients to include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression and to make sure that it was on all of the new patient forms going out so that people can see that and feel confident in that. We've done a series of trainings for many of our primary care sites, such as psychiatry, family medicine, internal medicine, um, pediatrics for the staff to help them be able to really as a staff be able to be welcoming with the patients who are coming in so those are kind of some of the ways that we're um, starting to expand the work into um, into the clinical sphere and very i good. suspect that we're going to see a lot more of that okay. and more demand yeah. all right very good well i look forward to hearing what your study shows since you've teased me now I, <laughs> right. I, I, you, you got to come back and give me the results we'll come okay. with the big reveal yeah there you go <laughs> stacy steinbach Brian Buford, thanks for being on the program. Thank Hold you on. for having us. All right, so one more thing before you leave here. Uh, we always try and wrap up with a Did You Know segment, a little bit of trivia about the University of Louisville, and you guys will like this. This is good news about the University of Louisville. <laughs> Since 2007, the Office of Community Engagement at UofL has tracked 21,000 instances of student community engagement opportunities representing more than 250,000 hours of community service and 200 plus community partner organizations working with U of L and West End residents in the West End of Louisville. So kudos wow. to our kids. Is, uh, That's right. Mm -hmm. So kudos That's to the powerful. University of Louisville. All right, that'll about do it for this edition of U of L Today with Mark Hebert, which you can hear every Monday and Tuesday night at six on 93.9 The Ville. You can also watch the programs on Metro TV, which is Louisville's government access channel and KETKY throughout the week. And I'll see you Monday mornings at 9.30 on WHAS-TV's Great Day Live with Rachel Platt and Terry Miners with a new story about research, students, or something cool going on at the University of Louisville. Thanks for listening to U of L Today with Mark Hebert. And go Cards!